Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living. Amen. Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Colonial Woods live stream. You're, a lot of you are joining us right now, and uh, we, uh, we are glad you're with us. Some of you right now are drinking a cup of coffee. Some are sitting in your pajamas. That's just fine. We're glad you're with us, and uh, I love what uh, Pastor Dan and Ann said earlier. Usually I have you turn to each other, right? I say turn to each other and uh, say uh, I like you or you look good today. So if you have to be sitting next to someone, turn to them and say, please stay six feet away. That's what you're going to say this morning, but I'm really glad that you're with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 118. We're in a series called Chosen. And uh, we've been working out of a, a theme, a concept that uh, God chose us from the very foundations of the earth. And we're going to be working on that concept again this morning. Um, I would tell you that I have watched way less uh, news and updates over the last couple of weeks than what I often do. I find myself that when we are getting into a rut and when I'm hearing the same kind of news over and over and over again, it just, it becomes for me a little overwhelming. If you're a person who tends to struggle, uh, you feel like you're being just a little overwhelmed right now, you feel like you're, you're dealing with some anxiety, I would just encourage you, it's okay to turn the station, it's okay to watch Bugs Bunny reruns, it's all right, that's a good thing. Sometimes we need to watch some things that just make us smile. And so I would encourage you to maybe turn that off and just glance at the news once in a while. But one of the things that I, it struck me this last week, and I hear it a lot, as you have probably watched, if you have anything in investments, you've heard about the Wall Street and you've heard about the Dow that's going down quite a lot. And I think it's gone something like around 9,000 plus points over the last several weeks. And something that they said occurred to me, and just this week it struck me as kind of funny. It said Wall Street really hates uncertainty. And that's why a lot of the craziness is going on right now. And, and it struck me, I thought to myself, well, who does like uncertainty? I, I don't know many people who like uncertainty. I suppose there are a few people who do out there, and they probably need to visit our counseling center, right? But uh, they, they, most of us just really don't like uncertainty. In fact, what I've noticed over the years is I would have rather, I'd, I would almost rather deal with certain bad news than uncertain, possibly good news. I, I, I'm not saying I don't want good news, it's just a lot of times what happens is it's the uncertainty that has a way of warning against my soul. You've got a, you've got a medical report that's still waiting to come back, right? The uncertainty of what it could be is almost harder than the reality if you just knew what it was you were dealing with. The uncertainty of whether your, your job is hanging on by a thread and you don't know if it's going to be there in the future. The uncertainty of whether or not you're going to be asked to relocate. The uncertainty in relationships. I find uncertainty has, it has a way of kind of shaking our core and our foundation more than certainty does. So today what I want to do is take some time to talk through some powerful choices we can make in some pretty uncertain times. Now we're actually going to begin in our theme verse for this series in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. Here's what it says. Paul says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We should just spend time in that one, one of our weeks together, right? We have every spiritual, that means, what that means is, every resource of heaven has been purchased for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Whew, I'm getting blessed. I'm going to come back to that in another week. Verse 4, for he chose us in him, Jesus Christ. So God chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now what struck me when I was looking at that is that this means that the Lord is timeless before the foundations of the earth. Before, before creation, God chose us. That means he's not limited by the time, a time frame such as we are. The second thing is, is that he is fully aware. He was fully aware then. In fact, he is fully in control. There is nothing that is happening today that is shaking God in any way. But here's what really blessed me. It says he chose us. 
We could say it this way. He chose me. Say that right now, would you? He chose me. You could even put your name in there. He chose Phil Whetstone before the creation of the earth, which means what? God knows my name. God knows my name. He knows where I'm at. He is the personal Savior. And because of that, we can answer those questions that often will overwhelm us during uncertain times. A Wednesday night, I shared with you a word out of Joshua chapter 1. By the way, if you didn't realize this, midweek, every week, I'm doing a message as well. And this last week, we talked about five words that are going to change your life. You can just catch them by going onto our website and just watching it. I've had a lot of folks that have been encouraged by that message over this week. But there are always three questions that tend to creep in whenever we go through uncertain times. The first one is, is God really going to show up? And then number two, if God does show up, will he really be enough? And then number three, will God keep his promises to me? Will God really show up? And if he does show up, he's going to be big enough for this situation. And if he, if he is big enough for this situation, will he actually keep his promises to me? And all of those words about him choosing, that he knows me, that he knows my name, that he's in control, all of that gets answered very quickly, doesn't it, when we're going through these times. Well, I want you to take your Bibles. We told you to turn to Psalm 118. If you don't know where that's at in your Bible, take it and go to exactly the middle of your Bible. Unless you got a lot of study notes or whatever, most people believe that Psalm 118 is the exact center of Scripture. And so you can just open it up. You'll be pretty close to that. Psalm 118 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. David wrote this psalm that is credited to David when they were rebuilding the temple in the book of Ezra, uh, chapter 3. They actually credited the words of this to David, so we assume they knew who the author was, and it's David today. I'm going to read to you about 18, 19 verses. I want you to get into the flow. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear God or fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. I could say, Let Colonial Woods say, His love endures forever. I could say, Let North America, United States, Canada, His love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and He answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He's my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed back and was about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. But I will not, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Now the Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness." And I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Now, that's not the whole psalm, but boy, when you start reading down through that, if the Lord has chosen us, which he has, then we need to make some choices about him, right? When we talk about being chosen, it's not just him choosing us, but there are some choices that each of us are going to make. Right now, there are hundreds of you that are gathering in with us, and we are so glad that you are. But the fact is, is you have choices to make in these days as well. And I want to share with you very quickly eight powerful choices that we can make in uncertain times that will make those times far more certain. 
Number one. First thing that I want to do as I look down through this passage is I'm going to choose to cling to the fact that God loves me. Now, he says it in verse 4, but he says it over and over again in verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. He is simply declaring that the God of the universe loves me. I want you to think about that. The God who created all things loves you. His loving kindness endures forever, that there are a lot of things that are going to fade away, but God's love never will. Now, by the way, you walk down through Scripture, and it, and it says that over and over again. In Psalm chapter 43, verse 4, when God is giving an encouraging word to the Israelites, he says, you are precious and you are honored in my sight. Did you realize that you are precious and honored in the eyes of God? Scripture tells us that God delights in his children. Now, I don't know how many of you are parents. In fact, well, maybe over the last couple of weeks, you don't delight in your kids quite as much. By the way, in Illinois, I don't know if you knew this or not, in Illinois they declared a state of quarantine where people can't go out of the house. Uh, you can only go out to get uh, groceries, essentials, but, but they left the liquor stores open. And I'm pretty sure they left the liquor stores open because the kids are home from school. That must be the reason they did that, right? Okay, that's funny. You laugh at home. You know that's funny. He looks at us and he says, you are precious and you are honored in my sight. I delight in my children. Look what it says. The spirit of God himself testifies to us that we are God's children. So here's what I love. God's word proclaims that he loves us, right? It becomes like this pillar, a foundation. And then the spirit of God who authored the word of God, the spirit of God affirms that into your heart. So not only does he write it down and declare that it is true, but he affirms it by his spirit. He loves you. And I have found that during uncertain times, I have to remind myself more and more, God loves me. And his love endures forever. Number two, number two, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose to call on God's promised presence. Now this was the whole foundation of Wednesday night, so I'm not going to spend all of my time going down through this again, but look what he says. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. Now, you're going to notice in this psalm, notice how he keeps repeating phrases over and over again. Three times he says, the Lord's love endures forever. Three times he says, the Lord is with me. He says later on, in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. There's a reason. This is a poetic emphasis in the Hebrew language. It is an emphasis that is helping us to understand that not only is it true, it is very true. Okay, so that's the emphasis. When Jesus says, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, that is, a, that is an Arabic Hebra, uh, Hebraic teaching methodology to affirm that what I'm saying is not just true, it's really true. Okay? So when you see the psalmist doing this, he's doing it on purpose. He says, what? Um, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. Uh, he is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. I find that in uncertain times, the enemy begins to whisper, you're on your own. By the way, is there a more discouraging thought that I'm on my own. I'm it. Somehow God has abandoned me. God has somehow forsaken me. Even Jesus on the cross. Wasn't it interesting in that, that moment? We can get into the whole meaning of the phrase, but he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a declaration. He was actually quoting a psalm that indicated that there are times in life we feel that way. But he said, but I'm going to choose to remember and cling to the fact that God never leaves me. That he promises me his presence. See, Satan will whisper in your ear, you're all alone. But God's word will proclaim over and over, 
I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Someone has uh, gone through Scripture and claimed that there are th at least 365 times in Scripture that God says, I am with you. It's a variation of it. Like, I am with you. I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Um, over and over again in Scripture. And I went through and started, and I didn't count all 365. Someone made the connection and said that means that, that he says it at least once for every day of the year, right? So that you'll always understand every day of the year. I love it, and I, I think God does that kind of stuff. And I think he smiles when we discover it, right, through the Holy Spirit. But here's what I want you to understand, that no matter what you're going through today, and I understand that for some of you, the biggest thing you're going through is not this virus. Some of you were battling things long before this ever even came on the radar. Some of you have been recovering from a grieving spirit. Some of you are dealing with end-of-life issues, either you personally or in your family. Some of you right now are, are dealing with what's, what's left of a relationship that has been declining for years. And I'm not trying to be heartless. The fact is, for some of you, this is not the biggest thing you're going through. And isn't it great how God's word just keeps saying to you over and over again, I'm with you. Isaiah 43, I'm with you. When you walk through the fire, when you go through the water, when you go through the river, I'm with you. Romans chapter 8 says what? I am with you. Romans chapter 8 later says, if God is with us, who can be against us? Over and over, we choose... If you can grab those five words, I will be with you. If you can grab those words, they will change your life. It's the power of presence. Number three. There's a third choice that we have to make. I'm going to choose to make God my hiding place. I'm going to choose to make him my refuge. I'm going to make, he's going to be my strength. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I appreciate all that our president is doing. I appreciate all that the government is trying to do. I do. I appreciate it. I, I was thinking to myself, we're trying to figure out how to, how to manage a, a congregation. I can't imagine ma managing a country. I, I just can't imagine that. And so as I've been praying for our president and vice president, all of his counsel, by the way, can I encourage you as a great way to pray for our, our, our president right now and specifically our president and vice president, but I, I would say for the heads of Congress, uh, for our, our Supreme Court, all of our local justices, I think it's just as true. As believers in Jesus Christ, what a day to be praying for Daniel's, Joseph's, and Esther's and Shadrach's and Meshach's and Abednego's. Those are all righteous, godly individuals in Scripture who were not the leader, but they were around the leaders and gave them godly counsel which blessed the entire nation. Say that, catch that. I have been praying for our, specifically our president, I've been praying for Daniels and Josephs, people who are wise, godly individuals who will make wise choices, give wise counsel that will impact and bless the entire nation. So believers in Christ, join me as we pray in that way, right? As we pray for our country in that way. We gotta pray for that. God, God uses people like that all around. But he looks at us and he says, I want, you, I want you to understand that as much as I appreciate everything we're doing, my strength and my hope is not going to be in my, my government. Some can trust in horses. Some trust in chariots. But I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord our God. It is better for me to take refuge in the Lord. What does Psalm 91 say? It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest. That means they'll be able to rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. All right. Number four. 
Number four, I choose in faith to release my fear to the Lord. I choose in faith to release my fear to the Lord. Now, I love this. Um, I've loved this for years when I discovered this. Here's what it says. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Now, what is David doing? David is proclaiming, these are not going to consume me. I am going to release this. I, okay, so I am overwhelmed. In the name of the Lord, I'm cutting it off. I'm, I'm worried about getting toilet paper. In the name of the Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Walmart early and I'm going to cut them off, right? All that stuff that we're dealing. Isn't it amazing? And I, I don't want to laugh at a situation, but I do find that sometimes I have to step back and smile just a bit of what it is that consumes our lives. And how God says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We have a high priest, it says in the book of Hebrews, that says what? That we can now come confidently before the throne of grace where we find mercy in our time of need. We're in a time of need. When Calvin was a little guy, we lived in Warsaw. He must have been, he was in diapers, so I don't know how old that is. I, I lose track of how old our kids were at certain times. He was still in diapers. And uh, so that was, was that, two years of age maybe, right in that age? He was, he was old enough to talk, but he was too young to be, he was starting to get the little, the, like the training pants, okay? So he'd be right in that ballpark. And Tammy called me. Um, I was away for some reason at a conference or something. And she called me one night and she said, Phil, she said, something is wrong with Calvin. She said, he is freaking out. And I said, well, what's going on? No, he won't. I mean, he's not just freaking. He will not let me put him down. He will not step on the ground. He will not step on the floor. He, he'll only, I can put him on the counter of the kitchen or I can hold him, but that's it. He is, I mean, he screams, Phil, it is, there's something wrong with him. And I, and I said, okay. And she said, I, I took him to the emergency room. I'm thinking, what in the world? Take the kid to the emergency room because he's freaking out. And they said he's having something like night terrors or something like that. But it was daytime. I don't know how, I don't pretend, I don't pretend to understand it. And here's what it is. He was convinced there was a mouse in his room. And that the mouse had climbed on him while he was sleeping. And he felt something, and, and he wouldn't wear clothes. He could wear a diaper. He would not wear clothes because anytime he put clothes on, it had a weird feeling, and he thought that mouse was on him. You could not. So I got home a day or two later, and, you know, I'm thinking, well, I'll just talk a little sense into the kid. Uh, yeah, that worked really well, you know. <laughs> And I said, oh, come on, buddy. I said, there's no mice in your room. There's a mouse in my room. There's a mouse. I go, no, what, Calvin, there's, there's no mouse in the room. I said, and if I try to put him on the ground, he would, I mean, it was trembling, freaking, like he would grab onto you, trembling. So I finally had an idea. And I thought, I don't know how to convince this kid there's not a mouse in his room. Because I, I took him in. He had bunk beds. I made him bunk beds, and I said, uh, uh, well, Calvin, I said, we'll just have you sleep in the top bunk because mice can't climb beds. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he, nope, nope, there's a mouse, there's a mouse. And so he wouldn't do it. So I went, I went up to the uh, local pet shop and uh, I bought one of those little feeder mice, you know, that they feed snakes and stuff. And I brought her home and I, I went back into his bedroom and uh, I shouted, oh, I got him! And because uh, I thought I got to do something, right, to convince this kid that I got this mouse. And so, so I took it out and he was out there and I said, I got him, buddy. I got him. And I pulled it out of this little box and there's a little mouse in there. And I go, I got him. I said, isn't he cute? And guess what he said? He looked at me and he goes, 
I told you there was a mouse in that room. And he was freaking out. And so, so I said, oh, buddy. I said, so I, I just stroked the mouse and stuff. And, and uh, I said, uh, is it, is, you know, I said, he's not so bad. I said, this is what we're scared about. This isn't so bad. And I said, uh, Calvin, I said, uh, how about we go out and let this little guy go? What, what do you want me to do with him? Kill it. Kill it, Dad. Kill it. Kill it. I said, no, no, no. I said, let's just go let it go out. No, kill it, Dad. Kill it. And all I could think in my brain is that in the name of the Lord, I cut him off. In the name of the Lord, I cut him off. And by the way, I never did kill that mouse. I have killed probably hundreds of mice, and I don't care because I don't like mice. But I couldn't kill this stupid thing. <laughs> It just didn't seem right. So I took him out and let him go in the, in, the, in the back alley area. But all I could think of in that story was in the name of the Lord, I want to kill this thing. I want to kill it. I want to kill my fear. I want to cut off my fear. And there are choices that we make when life is uncertain that in the name of the Lord, you know what? I'm cutting this off. I am not going to let this consume my life. Number five, got to finish her up. Number five, I'm going to remind myself of God's track record. Pastor Brian, I'm going to have you come up, grab that microphone over there. I'm going to remind myself of God's track record. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord has helped me. The Lord has been my strength and my song. He has been my salvation. Shouts of joy. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. Now, why is this important? David says that when I go through times of challenge, uncertainty, I need to remind myself of God's faithfulness. So, Pastor Brian, you got that microphone on? Is it on there? Good. We got her on. Pastor Brian. I, I asked you this week if I could bring you up a little bit and uh, um, some of you who, not all of you will know this, but Pastor Brian, back in October, was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. It wasn't really a question. Your PSA was elevated. They knew that you had it. They, they were waiting a little bit. And uh, so we've been praying, right? And we believe God uses doctors, and we believe, we believe that uh, medicine can be an answer, but we believe God heals. And um, I, I, there's just been fascinating over the last five months or so how God has continued to bring that level down. And um, this last week, you, or two weeks ago, you had an MRI, and they, they told you some stuff. Give us a real quick update. Yeah, they said that the, the MRI um, showed there was no um, uh, clinical response on the MRI, and so either the cancer is just so small now that it's un, you know, unintelligible on the, on the MRI and or it's gone. And, of course, my PSA levels have been coming down from a high of 6.7 uh, last fall down to 5.5 in October, and now it's 4.7. So yeah. um, now we don't have to do any treatment for now. We're going to just keep an eye and, on and, it and see how And uh, here's, what, here's, here's the vernacular, is that they don't want to say you're healed, and they don't want to say that it's gone. But what they did say is that, okay, it's so small we can't see it. So you either, it either is so small we can't see it, or you don't have it. Right? Am I accurate in saying yeah, that? That's exactly right. Okay, I think that's a pretty great testimony and praise. Yeah. And so, so one of the things that I've, I've encouraged, you know, and I realize that is not everybody's story. By the way, we did get another story this week of someone else who had similar types of responses. But I realize that's not going to be everybody's story perhaps because God does things in different ways. But I, that was such an encouragement to me this week to say, hey, in the midst of craziness, God is still calming and God is still working. Yes, so, amen. hey, thanks for sharing that, Brian. Let's give the Lord a hand. That's great. I'm going to have you turn off that microphone just in case. There you go, Pastor. And hey, so what is it? Now, here's the deal. That might not be your particular testimony, but look back in your life. When we go through, um, uh, and years ago, I went through a, a, a crisis counseling course, and we dealt, we, I, developed, I developed as one of my projects a, a whole thing on dealing with stress. And anxiety. And one of the things that we often talk about in coping through challenging times is to go back and recount how God has worked in the past. And when I see God's consistency in the past, 
And you know, you might be sitting here and you might be so discouraged right now that you, you're having a hard time recounting that. I'm going to challenge you to really dwell on that for a moment. It might have been a parent who came alongside of you, a friend who gave an encouraging word. It might have been an answer to a prayer. It might have been strength through a challenge. See, I tend, I tend to find that God's grace always meets us if we look for it. So look for God's grace. Number six, I'm going to decide to choose to keep on living. So what does that mean? Well, I will not die but live, is what David says. And I would say the application of this is, I am not going to let this current situation consume me. I'm still going to live. I'm still going to interact with people. I'm still going to get exercise. I, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to spend a little time in front of a TV. My life is not going to be in front of a TV. My life is going to continue. I'm going to choose to continue to live as normally as possible, interacting and doing the things that I know are healthy. We're figuring that out as a church, right? It was we're looking at Zoom, prayer connections. Our youth group this last week had their first uh, virtual youth group meeting. They had 70 people join in in a vir virtual room. Then they broke off into small groups and, and we're figuring out, right? So what is it? I'm going to choose to figure out how to keep living. I'm going to make those choices. Let me give you number seven. Number seven, I'm going to share God's faithfulness with others. There is a hoarding mentality, right? We talk about don't hoard. But I find that oftentimes we hoard God's faithfulness. We ask God to move. We ask God to meet. And yet we hoard it to ourselves, and so David says, I'm going to make a decision, verse 19 through 28, he's going to give God thanks. He's going to give God credit. He's going to use every opportunity he can to talk and tell about God's faithfulness. Hey, who is it in your life that God wants you to share God's faithfulness with? Or maybe it's going to be God's resources that you have plenty Maybe there's someone you can come alongside of. Maybe it's just a word of encouragement and hope. It's a phone call. It's a text. But just simply reminding of God's faithfulness in their lives. These are choices that we make. Oh, by the way, number eight, I'm going to keep doing this over and over and over and over again. Look at the very last verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Go to verse 1. Praise to, uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Go to the last verse, verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Go back to verse 1. Praise, uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is a unique type of Hebraic writing, which is called an envelope psalm. It is meant to be sung over and over and over again. And if I have learned anything about making choices through uncertain times, dealing with anxiety, dealing with stress, dealing with fears, dealing with uncertainty, if you are like me, I have found, I cannot one and done it. I have to keep on doing it, right? I just keep on meditating, keep on praising, keep on cutting it off. I make these choices not once a day. I make them countless number of times a day. I just keep training my brain, training my heart, training my will to make these choices. This morning... Uh, I was in prayer um, as I uh, was getting ready for today. And the Lord brought back a hymn. Actually, I thought it was just an old chorus, but it's a hymn. And he brought a, a hymn to my mind that um, I, I would just say I don't think I've thought about it for quite some time. Uh, it goes like this. 
All your anxiety, all your cares, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Okay. So I'm sitting there and I thought, oh, and then that happens a lot. When I'm in prayer, a lot of times songs come to my mind. And so I sat down after my prayer time and I, I pulled out um, my Bible and started going through it. And that hymn kept going back through my mind. And so um, I thought, well, that's a, that's a, for me, I mean, it's a very applicable hymn, right? But <clears throat> I hadn't thought of it for a while. So... Um, so I got on my phone real quick, and I, I said, you know, I don't, I don't even actually know who the author of that hymn is. And his name was Edward Joy. And um, I don't do this that often, but I, I thought, you know, I wonder what he was going through when he wrote that hymn. Because he wrote it for some reason, right? So I looked it up. Do you know when that song was written? During the pandemic of 1918. Isn't that incredible? Now you could say, man, what a coincidence. By the way, of all the hymns that I know, very few were written (laughs) between 1918 and 1920. And I thought to myself, all your anxiety, all your care, that was a pandemic where about 25% of the world came down with the Spanish flu. And it reminded me that God was faithful and that he is faithful. And the same God, right, the anxiety stuff we deal with, it's not new. There's a reason Jesus speaks to anxiety. There's a reason Peter says, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. I promise you, I promise you, whatever fear you're facing, whatever anxiety you're carrying, whatever uncertainty is overwhelming to you right now, he's in control, he's timeless, and he knows your name. And he is worthy to be trusted. Father, thank you for your word And thank you for challenging me to make choices that bring life. For some that are watching right now, there is anxieties. It has to do with their kids, groceries, an ailing loved one, loneliness. Right now, Lord, we release to you and cast all of our anxiety to you and ask you would bring the peace that passes all understanding in Jesus Christ. Thanks, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living.